Howdy, Kate. Hello, Pika. Happy Monday to you guys. Did you have a good Easter? It's going pretty well. I did a good day yesterday. Hello, Bellcut. I walked around outside in the sun with some friends. And we got some ice cream. Hello, Nookus. Antonio says, happy Monday. Happy Monday, Antonio. Ashish, do we have a handout for today? No, we don't. We're going off the grid. Let's go! Michael Scott. Oh, you were working on the project this weekend? I think it's a fun project. Yes, I went into the wilderness. Not so much. We went to a little park. We just walked around. Good afternoon, Mike. It's great. Bit confused a little on the ramp response. Okay. We can talk about it at the end of today. We can definitely talk about it. Hello, Jack. Hello, Amin. Hey, good morning, D Stratus. Good morning, Squared Circle. Hope you guys are having a good day. I think we're all done with winter. I think it's behind us. We're done with the cold. We're done with the snow. It's just going to be sunny days from here on out. Forever. Still picking out my classes on a scale of one to <laughs> to tears. How hard is MAE 515? Which one is 515? I haven't taken, I was a grad student here. I didn't take that course. Is that heuristic optimization? Anybody else taking it here? Time to get those snow tires off. I never even put snow tires on this, this winter. Sunny with rain and storms. Oh no. Fluids. Oh, I can't help you with fluids. I know about zero when it comes to fluids. Time to put the sticky boys on for Watkins Glen opening weekend. Ooh, are you going to the track? Happy Easter, Nikta. Dr. E, could I do an online independent study with you next semester trying to move to Rochester this summer? What are you doing in Rochester? Isn't Rochester just the boring version of Buffalo? That's what I heard. I didn't make that up. I just heard that from other people. Michael Scott, wait, you all from the same university? I'm just a random guy from a random country. You're not, you're not random. 
But yeah, we're at the University of Buffalo. My partner has a full-time job here. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Dr. Burge is the greatest of all time for fluids and thermo. Yes, he is. I know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm being facetious when I make fun of Rochester. All right, everybody, hope you're doing well. Rochester isn't that bad. <laughs> whoa, 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 Rochester greater than Buffalo? Dr. Stoink's also great. Yes. Hey, greetings from Turkey, Michael Scott. So glad you enjoy it. You're always welcome to, to hang out. Oh, yeah. Dr. Craig Snoik is fantastic. All right, I'm going to turn down the music a little bit. We're going to talk about the regulator problem today. We're talking about state feedback control. We all know the, who the goat is, and that will always be Mook. Oh, yeah. He's a role model. Let's quickly recap what type of model we're going to be working with here. So for a state-based model, and let's consider a CISO case. CISO stands for single input, single output. Because this is the type of regulator problem we're going to look at too. So CISO stands for single input, single output. So there's two parts. The first part is the output equation. So um, the variable we use for the output is y. And u is the input. And um, we're, we're just going to assume that there's one of each. One output, one input. So here's our output equation for state space. Y is C. Oh, and we're doing, we're doing discrete time here. So let's, let's put these, these K indices. C times XK plus D times UK. Let's put X up here too. state vector all right all right so we're going to assume one output one input but even if there's one output and one input there could be many states all right So I'm not gonna, so uh, I like to underline my vectors. That's why I put a, an underline under X here. But I'm not underlining Y and U because those are just scalars. Okay, let's do the state equation. X, K is A times X, K minus one plus B, U, K minus one. This seems familiar from MAE 340. That's exactly correct. You've seen this in MAE 340 for sure. So um, we're working with this type of model when we do state feedback. Now, I want to define what this regulator problem is. Okay, so Let's define the regulator problem, and then we're going to watch a couple YouTube videos to, do, to give practical examples of a regulator problem. And these are really my favorite types of control problems. Okay. 
So, okay, here we go. We're defining the regulator problem. So given a reference signal, like a reference is the signal that we're trying to track. Wheel out the TV, let's go. So we've been talking about like step references, ramp references. Um, the regulator problem is where the reference signal is zero, which might sound a little boring, but I'll show you it isn't. Okay, so given a reference R, the error is defined as we know it's the difference between the reference and your output so let's let's write it like this the error at step k is the reference at k minus your output at k but um so we'll say where for a regulator problem R K it's just always zero therefore the error is going to be zero minus Y of K so it'll just be equal to the minus of whatever your sensor output is linear algebra is useless as a course half is stuff you already know and the other half is useless for engineering. Are you sure about that, Jack? When I took linear algebra, I didn't really understand it very well. Um, but in retrospect, I would say it's very, very useful. <laughs> Jack, Jack is on a rampage today. I still don't know what a span or a base is. It, it's very abstract. I, I, I'll tell you that. But um, linear algebra is going to come in useful for state feedback control. Let me tell you this. Okay, so a regulator problem is where the reference is zero. Let's watch a couple of YouTube videos. I want to show you examples of a regulator. And the first one here... Some people in our class right now are trying to build this as a senior design project. This is a self-balancing pen. Okay, so why is this a regulator problem? The outputs, well, there's actually a couple outputs that we're trying to control here. I mean, the, the goal is to keep this pen vertical. So one of the outputs is... Uh, the pitch angle relative to this table, you know? So if you tip this a little bit, it's always trying to bring it back to zero. That's why this is a regulator problem. The reference is just a static zero position. And even these, um, even these flywheels here, our goal is always to bring them back to zero as well. Like we don't want these to just, so you see once it gets really still, even the flywheels kind of stop moving. Wait, what is that thing? Oh, a magnet? Or no, no, a weight. Okay. So we kind of perturbed the system. And we see that they're measuring the pitch here. We're trying to bring it back to zero. Okay, so that's a regulator problem. Let's look through a couple of these. This one's kind of fun. This is a triple pendulum. And right now it's just hanging down, whatever. But when we put it in this up, unstable position, we have this thing, it's sliding back and forth, trying to keep the angles, all of them, at zero. 
what would this what would this application be used for in real life this kind of balancing thing earthquake resistant buildings i think that for earthquakes wait mie lab one students are doing this not lab one there's some senior um capstone students trying to work on a balancing pen um now oh yeah look at that <laughs> i would say balancing like when we talk about earthquake resistance that's more a static structural thing you try to add a lot of damping so that the vibrations don't get out of control these kinds of balancing applications mike says robots like boston dynamics that's true um a, a lot of these are robotics actually uh, one of these is going to be a a practical robot okay this is just another i, I just want to give you a couple examples of regulators yeah segways so this is a regulator because it's trying to always bring the position of the ball back to zero Is this all related to adaptive control where they take feedback from the system and then adjust the parameters there? This could be adaptive control. You could make adaptive controllers in each of these cases. An adaptive. So an adaptive controller is a controller that learns as it does control. So if we go back to this one, actually, you could make an adaptive controller that is learning like what is the 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 weight here so that you you could add an adaptive control feature here the ball looking like it's going to fly off stress me <laughs> i know is, is it going to look how close it is to the edge is it going to go or is it going to stay on oh so he's changing the reference point here with the controller it looks like channel one channel two channel three um and actually, each of those is kind of, um, yeah, this is the anxiety machine. Okay, and so they can do a lot of cool stuff with this. Um, that's not really a regulator problem. This is a cool one. This is a balancing cube. And it's always trying to zero itself on this corner. Regardless of how you perturb that. it's really a beautiful thing or you can balance on an edge this is a regulator problem there's another uh senior design group trying to do do that where it just balances on an edge i'd like to see them walk you could do something like that okay oh okay what does this remind you of Perhaps something in Star Wars. <laughs> Our savior. BB-8. How is this a regulator problem? Can you explain this a bit more? Okay. So. Like. Um, so. There are some aspects of this that aren't a regulator problem. Like. We have a reference here that is changing, like uh, the position on the floor. Like if you could, if you think of like the X, Y position on the floor, we're kind of moving this robot around the room. But the regulator part of this problem is just the balance. Like that's something that never changes. You're trying to keep this uh, part of the robot oriented vertically. So that reference is always at zero and that control goal never changes. Okay, we're gonna show one more. This is our last one. And this is like an upgraded version. What kind of sampling rates are these using? So these are all running on Arduino, or, or um, most of these at least. And I would say a sampling rate is gonna be probably between 100 and 200 Hertz. Would traction and stability control be a regulator problem? 
So you're talking about like in a car. Um, you know, I would say, let's think about launch control for a car. When I say launch control, I mean, you're doing like a drag race and you're trying to blast a car off the start line as fast as possible. So the car generates traction by, well, we know the, the contact patch of, this, of the tire, we want it to stick to the ground. And if it slides, you actually lose traction. So if you give like too much torque on the tire and, you, and it overcomes the friction force, then you're actually in bad shape. You don't want to spin out the tires. So launch control is about having the tire stick and when the tire sticks, it also the rubber actually deforms because you're like torquing the wheel and it actually stretches the rubber. And that stretching creates a spring force that pulls the car forward. So launch control is trying to stretch the spring to the optimum point, which we use the slip ratio for that. And there's an ideal slip ratio of like 0.2. So we talk about this in road vehicle dynamics. Um, I don't know if that's a regulator problem because it's kind of more like a, a step reference where you start with zero slip in the tire. Like when I say tire, I mean slip, I mean the deformation, but then you wanna jump up to like a 0 0.2 slip ratio as quick as possible. I would say that's like a step. This is kind of cute. BMW has cool launch control feature. It's cool seeing slow motion on a wheel doing launch control and how many adjustments it makes. It's crazy. I think this robot here is at Carnegie Mellon or something, but um, this is the same kind of ball balancing robot right here. You have a couple motors and it's balancing on a ball. And wow, it is, it is really smooth. It's kind of cool, uh, later this guy is moving it around. Where is this? Kind of here. It's kind of like you can move it and set it somewhere. And it just continues to balance. Don't you wish your furniture had something like this underneath? So these are all regulator problems because at least one aspect of the control is trying to keep something at zero the whole time. Ballroom dancing robot. <laughs> yeah, videos from 2015, they feel so old now, right? Okay, so a regulator problem is you have some reference equal to zero. And for these balancing robots, the reference could be the, the angle and we want it to deviate zero degrees from vertical. All right. So how do you generate a controller that can achieve this? All right. So let's work through the math. So if we're using state space, we know that the output is equal to because we have our output equation up here. It's equal to C times your states plus D times your control input. So let's put that in here. All right. Now to simplify this a little bit, usually the direct transmission matrix is zero. That's the D matrix. So the error in a regulator problem is usually equal to your C matrix times your states at a given time. And we'll talk more about states as we go. All right, now if we want our robot to balance, we want this error to go to zero. over time so 
if you look at the limit of this series, as K keeps going from one to two to three to four over time, you want that error to go to zero. And um, so E K is a vector or a scalar. In this case, it's gonna be a scalar because we're considering the single output case. And so the error will also just be a scalar. But I'm glad you brought that up because if the limit of the error goes to zero, it implies that the states also go to zero, the state vector. But that's that's not just one number. That Even if you have one input and one output, you could have hundreds of states. This implies the state vector goes to zero because the error is equal to C times the states. All right. So we, we also have this. The limit is K goes to infinity of our state vector. That has to go to a zero vector, a vector full of zeros, however many states you have. And um, like we wrote up above, we know the dynamics for X. It's A times my st state vector from the previous time step plus my input from the previous time step. And right now we're just assuming there's one input. We're starting simple. All right. Okay, so we want to design a controller, basically, that's going to drive all of the states to zero. But um, there's an infinite number of ways you can drive the states to zero. Just like for any controls problem, it's, it's really an art um, where you have some specifications, like how quickly do you want to go to zero? Do you want to overshoot a little bit? Um, what kind of rise time are you looking for? So... So we want to drive the states to zero, but first we have to choose some target poles. So this is like always our first step for designing a controller. Some target, and we'll call them closed loop poles. This describes how we drive the system to zero. And I, I like to call these Z star. That's what we use for the root locus. So it's a vector of poles. Now, the number of poles in this vector is equal to the number of states. So we're, we're looking at a one input, one output system, but like I said, there could be any number of states that describe the underlying dynamics. And uh, you have to pick the same number of poles as the number of states. And that, that can be a little bit tricky. Okay. Something for state space. Poles are the same as eigenvalues of the A matrix. All right. So we got to remember that. Okay, so here we get to the control input. To solve a regulator problem, define your control input in this way. To be the input and let's put it at step K minus one here. It's gonna be minus a gain matrix times your states at that corresponding time step. So we call this the gain matrix. Actually, we call it the feedback gain matrix to be 
more precise. Feedback gain matrix. Oh, I still didn't give myself enough space. There we go. So right now we're assuming we have one input. So this is just a one by one. It's a scalar control input, but the state vector, it's n by one. So that means that this gain matrix needs to be one by n. So it's like a row. If you have two states, it's gonna be a one by two matrix, one by n. Sorry, is there a reason why it's a step behind or is that the define it this way part? The reason I'm defining it right now a step behind is because I'm going to plug it in right here in the next step because I want to show you why we define the input to be this way. Okay, so let's do that right now. Should have just wait. No, I'm really glad that you asked. You guys should always feel free at any time to throw a question in the chat. All right. Okay, here we go. So why did we choose this form? Okay, substitute it into the state equation to find out. Okay, so x, k is gonna be equal to a times x, k minus one, plus b times u, k minus one. But we're gonna define u to be this. The feedback gain matrix times our states here. Now we have x, k minus one in both of these terms. So what I can do is I can gather terms like this. And so now I have this equation which looks like a homogeneous equation now, meaning the input has kind of disappeared and it just looks like it depends on the states. XK depends on XK minus one. And how did that happen? Well, because we made the input to be a function of the states. And that's kind of why we call it state feedback. Like if you think about the feedback loops we drew before, um, your control input is usually a gain times the error. And the error, if you backtrack it, the error is a function of your measured output. And in state space, the output equation depends on the states. Um, so the control input here is dependent on our states, which in practice you achieve that with feedback. We'll get more into it. We'll get more into it. But this matrix right here, A minus BK, I like to call this the closed loop plant um, or closed loop system matrix. And I just use a closed loop as a symbol. So we have XK is, once we activate this input for the regulator, my states at this time are equal to the closed loop system matrix times my states at the previous time. Is there any way to visualize these state equations in block diagrams? Yes. Um, and I think, oh man, it's, it's, it's not as pretty as the way it looks with transfer functions. Um, let's see, I can even pull up 
There's one I tried to make last year. Where is this? Oh no. Crusader. Mm. I don't know where I put that. But you certainly can. It's just kind of hard to get an idea of what's going on. I hear you. I hear you. But all what I would just keep in mind right now is this for now. That my control input is some matrix times our states. And that's why we call it state feedback. Because the control input depends on the states. Some of the states you can measure with a sensor. Other states you're going to have to estimate using an estimator. It'll become more clear as we do examples. But in the end, it's going to work the same way in practice where you're going to put some difference equation like u, k is going to be equal to some series of things. Uh, and that's what we're going to put on the Arduino to run our regulator. Okay, so here's the point though. The eigenvalues of a closed loop are the closed loop poles. And this is where the control design comes in. These should be equal to Z star. These should be equal to Z star, which are our target closed loop poles. So we calculate the feedback gain matrix K such that this happens. And that is the essence of solving the regulator control problem. And I want to do an example. I want to do an example to show you how this works. So this example is about calculating the feedback gain matrix for a regulator problem. Okay. So we made a state space model last class. And I want to keep working with that. So first I'm just going to write like the template for these equations and then we're going to bring them back. We have to go back a page. Okay. So the C matrix, I'm going to copy this. So this is our output equation. I got to make that a little bigger. Let's get the state equations. Copy this. All right, so this is the C matrix, it's one by two. This is the D matrix, it's zero. Here's our A matrix, it's two by two. 
which implies that we have two states for this particular system. And this is our B matrix, it's two by one. So we have one input, one output, but two states. Now, let's say I wanted to uh, AI violation. What did I do? Let's say that I have some target closed loop poles. Uh oh. Copy paste. Academic integrity. Okay, let's say these are my closed loop poles. Z star. Let's just make it simple. 0 0.5 plus or minus 0 0.5 I. Now, usually this comes from a set of performance constraints, as you guys are familiar. Um, and I've been using a vector notation. So, like, the way I would write this as a vector, I would have... One of them, that's the positive conjugate, and one of them, that's the negative. Is UK actually a scalar in this problem? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, for the dimensions of all of this to work out, this is one by one. This is two by one. This is one by one. Yes, certainly is. Okay, now the, the characteristic equation that gives us these roots, let me just give you that really quick. Because we're gonna use this. It would be lambda d squared minus lambda d plus 0 0.5 equals 0. If you get the roots of this polynomial, it's going to give you back those target poles. You'll see where this characteristic equation comes in in a second. Okay, so for state feedback, we know that we're going to, to define our input here to be a feedback gain matrix times our states. Okay. Good grief. So let's assume that we do that. So we're going to have A times XK minus 1 minus B K X K minus 1. No minus in front of fancy K. Oh, thank you, thank you. Because we definitely do need a minus here. So we plug that in. And then this gives us XK is A minus B k xk minus one and this is our closed loop a matrix and the eigenvalues of this have to be equal to z star but where do the eigenvalues come from they come from the characteristic equation which we can get from this matrix this comes back to linear algebra, okay? You thought you'd never use this again. Let's talk about the eigenvalues of this matrix. Okay, so let's get the characteristic equation of our closed loop A matrix. So it comes from the eigenvalue problem. 
So we have a minus b times k times an eigenvector. Let's just call it p. That's going to be equal to my root. And these are discrete time roots. So p here, this is, maybe I'll make this clear. This is a closed loop eigenvector. So these p's are, and this is a closed loop eigenvalue, lambda d. And we want that to be equal to z star. I said the course was meaningless to engineers, not the concepts. Engineers use uh, linear algebra all the time. I just have to give you a hard time about this. That's all that's happening here. Okay. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. Okay, so we have this eigenvector on both sides. How about we bring this stuff over to the left-hand side? So I'm going to have lambda d times i plus a minus b k times the eigenvector is equal to zero because I subtracted everything away from the right-hand side. Now, at this point, you know, um, in order to make this equation zero, there's a couple possibilities. One possibility is that this eigenvector is zero, but we call that like a trivial case, um, which is not what we want. So another possibility is that the determinant of this matrix is equal to zero. And that just means that this um, that this matrix can't be inverted. Are eigenvectors denoted by P vectors or fancy Fs? Oh, I see what you're saying. No, these, I, these are P uh, just with a little underline for the vector. So I'm just doing a P with an underline. You can cast Twitch streams to your TV? Good grief. the future okay and it turns out this right here this is the characteristic equation for our closed loop a matrix I can watch Twitch, Twitch streams on my PS4. I've done that. I have certainly done that. Okay, so here's the connection point. I want the roots of this characteristic equation to be equal to Z star. Well, I know that the characteristic equation has to be equal to this. Why is it not minus lambda d times i it's a very good point here and the answer is that i made an error which has never happened ever thank you guys i appreciate that Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so let's let's keep going with this. Um, let's keep going with this. Okay. 
So this has to be equal to lambda d squared minus lambda d plus 0 0.5. And, and yeah, that's all still equal to 0. But we're going to focus on matching these terms up right here. And that's how we're going to solve for what this feedback gain matrix has to be. OK, here we go. So we're, we're going to grind through the math in the next couple minutes, and it's going to give us our feedback gain matrix. Let's do it. So we're going to have the determinant of minus lambda d times i plus our a matrix. Where'd you go? 0, 1, minus 0 0.4, minus 1.3. 0, 1, minus 0 0.4, minus 1.3, minus our B matrix, which is 0, 1, times our feedback gain matrix. Do you remember the size of the feedback gain matrix? one by n. What's n? Aha! So I'm just making a one by two matrix and I'm calling the elements K1 and K2. And once we solve for those, we'll have our feedback gain matrix. So, okay, this has to be equal to lambda d squared minus lambda d plus 0 0.5. Okay, let's do this in a couple stages. If you multiply this out, a 1 by 2 times a 1 by 2, so the first row is going to be 0 times k1, 0 times k2, and the second row is going to be 1 times k1. 1 times k2. So this is going to be 0, 0, k1, k2. So let's, let's move on to the next line. So we're going to have the determinant. I'm going to try to do, I'm going to try to combine all three of these in one step. What's n again? n is the number of states in your system. And your, um, yeah, it's the number of states. So we have two states. You can also tell the number of states by just looking at the dimension of the A matrix. That's the quickest way to check. The A matrix is always N by N, number of states by number of states. Okay, we're going to try to do this in one step. So I'm going to have minus lambda D. So this is the top left element, plus zero. Minus zero. Oh, geez. Okay. And then we're going to have zero plus one minus zero. Okay, this is pretty brutal so far. Zero minus zero point four minus K one. And then I'm going to have minus lambda D minus one point three minus K two. So the determinant of this matrix, once again, okay, so the determinant of a two by two is just this diagonal, take the product of those two, and then subtract the product of, of these two. Right? I'm just waiting for the day when I don't lose my concentration in the middle of the lecture and don't have to rewatch it. I'll just, I'll confess that I was never somebody who, when I watched a lecture, I could understand what was going on. Actually, it was very rare. 
And I always felt like, am I dumb? <laughs> Seems like everybody else gets it. But no, I think that's just how lectures are. I think it's very rare to, um, to watch a lecture and understand... I, they've done some studies on this where it's like you you just on average people retain a very small part of, of lectures i watch a lecture to absorb a tiny bit and then learn most when i do the homework antonio like that that that's kind of how it is for me yeah for me i the only way i learn something is i really have to grind through uh, a homework i have to go through a lecture but it's it's always good like when you're when you're stuck no 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 because I don't think lectures are pointless I don't think lectures are pointless. Um. Because I mean, for one, you can a lecture is most. Whoa, how do I say this? Like, let's say you're stuck on a homework problem and you're like, oh, I kind of vaguely remember we talked about this in some way in lecture. Then when you go back and you're like, look, I know exactly what I'm looking for in this lecture so that it'll help me solve this problem. That's when it's helpful. Um, so that's why people try to do like flipped classrooms, but that has its own problems. Um, Lecture for me is most about knowing where to look for the equations on the homework. Yeah. I mean... It's tough. But all that to say, if you're a person who watches lecture and you don't understand, you're not alone. Okay, let's finish this example. I know we're running a little bit over. We're close to the end. Uh, remember, we're solving, our goal is to solve for K1 and K2. All right, determinant. Okay, so I'm going to have minus lambda D times minus lambda D minus 1.3 minus K2 minus one times minus 0.4 minus K1. Okay. I hope I did that right. Let's multiply this out. Lambda D squared plus 1.3 plus K2 lambda D plus 0 0.4 plus K1 I think this is working out. Oh yeah, it's working out. Look at this. Wait, this is a plus 0 0.5. You have to compare the left and right hand sides of this equation, like lambda d squared, lambda d squared. Okay, nothing to do there. Look at this lambda d term. If I, so 1.3 plus K2 had better be equal to the coefficient on this side, which is, um, well, it's a minus one in front of lambda D. So we have from this, 1.3 plus K2 has to be equal to minus one. And then next, if you look at 0 0.4 plus K1, on this side, we see that that has to be equal to 0 0.5. So our second equation is 0 0.4 plus K1 equals 0 0.5. So if you do this, you can just solve for what these control gains have to be. Like K2, it's gonna to have to be minus 2.3. K1 has to be 0 0.1. So then our K matrix K1, K2, it's 0 0.1 and minus 2.3. So our control input, remember, is U at step K is minus my gain matrix times our states at K. 
So it would be 0 0.1 minus 2.3 times, um, I don't know, we'll call it like X1K, X2K. Those are just my two states. And so this is like the line of code you would throw in the Arduino. My input at this time step is 0 0.1 times my first state minus 2.3 times my second state. Sometimes the states are something you can directly measure with the sensor so you can plug them in, but a lot of times we're gonna have to estimate those. So that's what we're gonna do. Okay, one thing I wanna show you really quick, quick, quick. This is how we verify because our closed loop poles are the eigenvalues of A minus B times K. So what you want to do is you want to check if these are equal to Z star, which was 0 0.5 plus or minus 0 0.5 I. So I want to actually do that in MATLAB really quick. And then we're and then we're done. And then I'll just take I'll take some questions on the project. So my A matrix, zero one, minus zero point four, minus one point three. B matrix is zero on top of a one. And then our feedback gain, we just calculated that it would be zero point one minus 2.3. So our closed loop A matrix is A minus B times K. Pika says, wait, did we lose the negative? Okay, we'll check that. But let's check the eigenvalues of this. And remember, Z star is 0.5 plus or minus 0.5i. And it worked. So you always want to check if it's doing what you intended. Okay, let's go back here really quick. Pika asked a great question. Zero point, I, uh, I missed another minus sign. Is this the day of just missing minus signs okay i gotta put a minus there <laughs> okay so then i put a minus there and then i put a plus here all that sunshine took the negativity away i see what you did It is a sunny, beautiful day today. Okay, that is our first example of a, of a regulator problem. And we're gonna do more examples. And we're gonna apply it to real life systems. Um, okay, so that's it for lecture content today. I know people were starting to ask things about project one and I saw people were answering each other's questions, which is amazing. Hey, Dr. E, have you ever failed a class? Um, I haven't failed a class. Um, the, I'm trying to think about classes I didn't do well. Oh man, I failed. Okay, no, I didn't fail this class, but I, I think it's basically because of um, the professor. Um, so as a graduate student, I took a course called Functional Analysis taught by Abani Patra. Functional analysis is like math math. Like kind of like a pure math thing. And oh boy. 
That was tough for me to follow. We took this exam in that class. I had a couple proofs. And, uh... I wrote some stuff down on the test. But I think it, just because it was uh, a really tough course, Dr. Potra was really generous to all of us. Actually, by the time, like I had to do a final project and I felt pretty good about that. But um, any other measure for that course, I was, I was struggling. It wasn't for lack of trying. Um, I just didn't really have the prerequisite knowledge to, to flourish in that class. Let's just say that. <laughs> um, are you open to accept research assistance? It's something we can talk about. I'm not really doing the research that I'm doing right now. It's more projects. Like I'm trying to build like stuff we saw in the YouTube videos today, I want to build that stuff. And the reason I want to build it is so that I can deploy it in classes and um, and actually make it to a point where students can assemble it themselves. Like maybe I prepackage some of this stuff that give you a head start on building some of that stuff on your own. Um, so, I mean, if you're interested in helping me build those types of things, you can reach out to me. Um, Offworlder, so we should avoid that class. I, you know, I, I really enjoyed that class. Like, there are... Um, yeah, I'm making... Yeah, that, that's a good way of describing my research. Right now, I'm trying to make things that are geared towards teaching and making teaching more hands-on for the students. Like this example that we did, like I would love to just do one example and then say, hey, let's build it or something, you know? But that's, I don't have a lot of those things to, to, to demo right now. So I'd like to build more. If it makes anyone feel better, I limped through Calc 1 and 2 and had to retake Calc 3, still finish my degree. Yeah. No, guys, I think it's like everybody has a different path and everybody learns differently. Um, and like for me, it takes a long time for things to really click. But once they do, I'm like, yeah, 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 I got this. Um, but I know when I took courses, it made me feel like, wow, I'm really lagging behind. But but once I like studied and studied and studied, I had to study a lot. I had to study a lot. Um, then I could do well. Um, but yeah, I would say keep working hard. And don't be discouraged. Just keep working hard. If you enjoy studying this stuff, just keep going. Keep working hard at it. Don't be discouraged. It's all right. Belka says, I, uh, Pika, yes, you can email me. For project one, I know for the step response, we had RKT is too high, but I'm confused what to do for the ramp where R at KT is equal to KT. Would you be able to offer some advice? Yes. So like a ramp, the reference at time equals KT is just equal to K times your sampling period. And this is kind of a fancy way of saying like, like if you plot this as a function of time, this ramp is always going to be equal to um, like when time is equal to three, the value of the ramp is also going to be equal to three uh, because K times T is equal to time itself. So um, when you're Simulate. Yeah, yeah, you got you got it right. You got it right. 
You got it right. Um, Ashish says, I would love to get a bit of ma uh, machine learning. My grant project is related to adaptive control where I'm working on applying machine learning to adjust the parameters. Right, I, I remember reading your grad project proposal. I still have to figure out that part for the project, but I would love to work on projects. Yeah, I mean, you can, it's also great, like even if you're studying machine learning to have some pilot system to, to test it on. Like if you have a balancing robot and you're like, hey, I, this is how a PID controller performs or like I designed this controller using root locus. But then you might be like, um, but look, when I hang a weight off the edge of this balancing robot, um, the controller doesn't account for it, so it falls over. But maybe with machine learning, it quickly adapts and learns or something like that. So it's really compelling to show what machine learning, what a difference it can make um, on a real system. De-stress, is there office hours today? Yes, there is. At um, 4 p.m., I'm gonna be on Discord from four to five. Basically, it's just trying to get as close to the plot TT like we did one lecture for the ramp. Yes. Yeah, like one of the goals for the project is when you're tracking a ramp reference, find a controller that gets as close to following this line as possible. With machine learning, you can solve some problems that traditional controllers have problems with, like cart pull swing up. Yeah. Yeah, swinging up the inverted pendulum, getting it into that starting position. Oh man, there's so much cool stuff out there. Yeah, there is. What if our output stops at six folds, but keeps going if we increase the ramp time? Oh, um, don't worry about the ramp case when we're talking about six volts. Um, that's a concern you need to be worried about for the step reference. Because you're right, when you're doing a ramp, that means you keep increasing the speed of the motor with time and eventually any controller would need more than six volts. So you, you just need to look at the, the step for that. For project one, my controller has a max voltage about 1.8 volts for the two pi step response. I'm worried that something's wrong because it's so far under six volts. Does that max voltage seem reasonable? It can be, yeah. It probably is reasonable. Um, the the voltage is going to spike up the faster you make your controller. But the constraints for the project are that the settling time is. Um, like around one second, I can't exactly remember. But that might be slow enough to where you don't have to pump up the voltage like crazy. So it's, it's more like really fast controllers where you have to worry about that saturation. It may be that you don't hit six volts. That's right, Bilk, it's uh, focus on the step response for that six volt condition. Also, when we look at our closed loop poles, they need to contain the complex pair we chose based on the constraints. Yes, that's the goal. Like you have 
that's like the whole flow of this. You start with some performance constraints, and then that, one of the pieces of that is you pick Z star, your target closed loop pulls. <laughs> yeah, the, the, like when you, the whole point of designing a controller is to make it behave in a way that you specify. And the language we use to specify how the controller performs is Z star. Interesting, I'm gonna try picking faster Z star and see how that affects it to better my understanding. Hey, that sounds like a great thing to do. Like once you, yeah, once you find a controller that works for you, try playing around with some other closed loop poles and you'll see the performance changes a little bit. Um, that sounds like a great idea. Hey, you're welcome, Belkit. Thanks for the questions. All right, everybody. I think that's it for today. I'm going to be on Discord for office hours at 4 p.m. Definitely come by if you have more questions or if you just want to hang out. All right, Pika, thank you as well. Thanks for always asking great questions. I appreciate it. And for catching my errors. I can always count on you. See you Wednesday. Hey, thanks, Ashish. See you. Hey, Timothy. Have a nice afternoon. Bye bye. Ad na 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 na. Hey, thank you, Jimelino. Adios.